so I am very happy to have you all here today. I um, enjoyed the morning sessions very much. And it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Len, who will introduce our keynote speakers. Uh, before this event, uh, a reporter uh, contacted me and, and had asked, uh, is it weird that ITS is organizing this? Why isn't an academic unit organizing this? And I thought, it's not weird at all, right? That um, ITS, uh, the faculty, students, and staff involved in ITS, are charged with the execution of the university's mission uh, in the same way that any other academic unit is. And so I think it is wonderful that ITS is organizing this conference here. And as well, it, since the technology is ubiquitous and employed across the university, it makes the most sense, right? Uh, so it's wonderful, I think it's great, and I think it really shows uh, the collaborative nature of the university in the area of technology across the whole of the campus. So, uh, and I can tell you in my particular case, ITS has been incredibly supportive in the programs that are important to me, we, uh, which are numerous in the area of technology. In particular, on the curricular side, we have a few courses coming up that I think will greatly expand the technology footprint and the technological, um, or the classes available to students in the area of technology in the upcoming years. So for example, here at the Yale School of Management in the spring, we have a new course on the management of software development, right? So we take we take MBAs and we make them write code and we make them manage each other and they come out as great product managers and scrum masters and uh, they understand kind of all of the layers of a modern web stack. So that's fantastic. We also have a new course in the computer science department that I'm co-instructing next year, uh, which is computer science 113. And that is essentially uh, for Yaleys who want to create the next Twitch, right? Uh, so it's at scale consumer web uh, mixed with entrepreneurship, lean startup, human centered design, all these kind of great things. And so I think that there is a great deal of really interesting things going on on campus in the area of technology and in the area of entrepreneurship. And these are both uh, near and dear to my heart. And I am sincerely appreciative of all the efforts that Lynn has led uh, uh, as CIO of the university. So Lynn's job is essentially framing our strategy as a university in the area of technology, right? And helping us all to employ technology to its greatest effect within the university. Uh, Len is, um, I think, well regarded in his uh, execution of those duties, right? I, I know that he is always emphasizing his four E's of leadership, maybe which are descended from Jack Welch, something energy, energize, and execution. I always, and I'm trying to encourage him that there's a fifth one that is entrepreneurship. Um, so, uh, so Len, I think, is doing a fantastic job leading the organization. It is my great pleasure to welcome him up here. Len was. Formally, you may know, uh, here he's in charge of a massive organization, right? Our, our technology across campus, huge responsibility. Formally, he did that at Columbia, the business school, and before that at Merrill Lynch. Is that right, Lynn? So, uh, you know, long history of technology leadership across many organizations, and it's a delight to have him here. And so, Lynn, that is my fantastic introduction for you. If you would take the stage, you may introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> nice job. I feel like I, have, I, I, I owe you 20 bucks or a drink for that one. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Halloween. I wore my orange tie especially for the, the occasion, so I hope you recognize that. I don't usually wear this color. But uh, I'm really excited about today. This is the culmination of uh, conversations we've been having since I have arrived. Uh, what I've always known is that there is a fantastic amount of technology being used on campus. Uh, and it's not just technology that uh, ITS is supporting, but it's technology that people are deploying in all sorts of ways across the campus. And um, uh, today, what I want to talk to you about, and I have a, some prepared remarks, is, is three, essentially three things. Maybe, uh, Kyle, this is how I remember things. It's two Ps and four Es. But, so today I'm going to talk about, and you can take these away, I'm going to talk about passion, which is one of the two Ps. I often talk about passion and pride. Um, pride is around this incredibly uh, uh, fantastic uh, institution that we're all part of. Um, and I'm going to talk about two Cs today. I'm going to talk about community and culture, because I think that uh, uh, 
the way you can think about IT, and it's not just ITS. ITS is, uh, you know, a 400 plus person central organization, but we also have uh, about another 300 IT partners on campus. So there's about seven or 800 IT professionals on campus that all collaborate in making technology work for Yale. So today I want to talk about two C's, which is uh, the community of uh, technology, pr technology practitioners on campus and the culture, the culture that I've seen in the short time I'm here continue to emerge as a strong technology culture. So let me begin uh, my prepared remarks. Um, first, I want to start with a couple of thank yous. Uh, this is the first Tech Summit, and it would not be possible without you, uh, faculty, staff, alums, and students. So thank you. Particular thanks goes to Alan Uses, the CIO. Alan, are you here? Oh, there he is. He's right in front of me. I'm looking for you way back there. Alan Uses is the CIO uh, of the School of Management. Uh, he's been a great partner, provides great leadership and counsel for all things IT on campus. So a uh, particular thank you for Alan. I uh, also want to want to thank our uh, vendor sponsors. I don't know if any of you are in the room, but uh, uh, we have vendor sponsors who've made today possible at no cost. Uh, we have HB Communications, who does fantastic work building the technology that's in many of these rooms across the campus. Uh, we have Juniper Networks with us today, a great, another great partner who has worked with us to build our new science network for moving big data around campus. Uh, we have IBM with us. IBM uh, recently partnered with us, uh, working with faculty, looking at ways we can create collaborations using techno recent technology at uh, IBM. And IBM was also the supplier of our recent new high-performance computing cluster, which is emerging as our new standard platform for high-performance computing. And last, the Lenovo Gov Connection uh, partnership that is providing uh, desktops, laptops across the campus. They've all, again, have, have donated to make this event uh, a no-cost event for all of us. A very special thank you goes to Susan West, who supported, who, with the support of dozens and dozens of, Susan, where are you? Please raise your hand. I know you're out there somewhere. Hey, Susan. Susan uh, has done an amazing job working around the clock, organizing the event, um, and I know this doesn't get done with one person. She has lots of people supporting her, lots of you in orange shirts. Thank you so much for all the extra time and effort you've put in. Uh, there's too many of you to thank, but uh, it's, it's, it's been amazing what's gone into put this event today, uh, together today. Uh, and then there's just one announcement, and that is that tonight is the kickoff of YHack and Hack Yale's uh, annual hackathon. And our best wishes go out to them. Uh, uh, I'll be heading over there tonight, and uh, uh, it's an amazing event. I think there's 3,000 students, somewhere around 3,000 students that are going to be at West Campus, and they're going to be hacking from 7 o'clock tonight until some point on Sunday. And uh, it's just a great event. And again, I think it speaks to the culture of technology that we have on this campus. It really is amazing. So today, uh, you are hearing firsthand how technology at Yale is impacting scholarship and research, teaching and learning, entrepreneurship and innovation, and lastly, how technology is impacting the delivery of high, higher education at scale and the efficiencies that are driving costs in a positive way. Uh, so the big question you may have is, why a tech summit? What is the objective and how will we know if we are successful? The answer is simple. Experience the passion, build the community, and nurture the culture. Those are the three things I hope you can take away from today. Let me begin with passion. So what's your passion? What makes you get out of bed every morning and want to go to work? For me, it starts with knowing that I work at the best university in the world, and with that comes opportunities that not only benefit Yale, but potentially all of higher education. The challenges that Yale and higher education face are well documented in our country. My passion is to drive real technology solutions that address these challenges while enabling the greatest platforms for teaching and learning, research and scholarship. 
I believe that the work that we do is what gets us up in the morning, and it is that work that can be enabled through technology. And it is that technology that you're going to hear about today. Today, our community comes together to learn and share innovative ways technology and the culture of technology has grown and continues to grow on campus at Yale. What I hope you will find is that beneath the innovation is passion. Passion is what drives solutions. Passion for solving big problems and challenges in our society and business. Challenges of finding new discoveries that lead to cures. It is passion that drives our community and technology is the fuel that helps manifest these ideas. I also believe today is a monumental occasion for Yale. We are all going to hear firsthand accounts of the tremendous and profound ways technology is impacting the world. It is a day when Yale faculty, students, alums, and staff can come together as a community to reshape the culture and begin what I hope to be a growing dialogue about the vibrant ways in which technology is being used to drive new breakthroughs, cure diseases, improve student outcomes, share knowledge with the world, and spark entrepreneurial enterprises. I stand here today to tell you that tech is alive and thriving at Yale. It isn't just enabling strategy, it is the strategy. The Tech Summit is a first for Yale. So today is the day we drive a stake in the ground and declare our high-tech prowess. Today is the day that we come together as a community to unite and drive the change. And today is the day we demonstrate our passion for conquering and solving the big problems. Today as a community, let, let's seize the tremendous opportunities that technology has to offer. So that's how I feel about today. Yale is an amazing place. There's so much going on. And it, for me, this Tech Summit is all about building community. This isn't about ITS, this isn't about IT. Actually, I wish at some point we drop the I. It's just T. It's just T and it's just technology at Yale. And there's so much going on and the more we can begin to build a community, that's when I believe we're going to truly see the amazing culture that exists here at Yale around technology. So with that, let me in introduce our very special keynote speakers. Uh, I, I am really excited that uh, these two individuals have agreed uh, to come. They're recent alums, 05, and they're here today to speak at the inaugural Tech Summit, uh, one of which I hope will be a series of many, right, Susan? We're going to do this every year. <laughs> uh, it was just a short time ago that Justin and Emmett were students on campus, Justin at Brantford and Emmett at Davenport. Uh, it was here, I believe, uh, that they will share that their roots of success were nurtured. Um, uh, Justin Kahn, 05, is an uh, internet entrepreneur. He is best known for founding Kiko, the first Ajax web calendar. Justin TV, a live video streaming platform, Social Cam, a mobile video sharing app, Twitch, which they'll probably talk about, uh, an online demand maid service exec. Is that, is that did I read that one right? Um, uh, he is currently a partner in a seed fund at a seed fund Y Combinator. Justin graduated from Yale with a degree in physics and philosophy. Emma Cheer, 05, founded and C founder and CEO of Twitch along with uh, Justin Emmett, it's, is also co-founder of Justin TV and a part-time partner at Y Combinator, where he advises fledgling startups on product and strategy. And in 2012, Emmett was included in Forbes magazine on their 30 under 30 list. So these are two very successful alums, and I'm so delighted that they've taken some time out of their busy schedules to come with us today. So please join me in giving both Amit and Justin, a very warm welcome back to campus. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. All I'm, right. It's been a while since I've been called a recent alum. I like yeah. that. <laughs> Makes me feel young again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, um, I've got to say I'm a little disappointed today because I only see one person in costume. Yeah. Uh, happy Halloween. Come on, where's the spirit? Yeah, where's the spirit? Um, but we're actually really excited to be back here. It's, it's pretty cool. It's such a great honor. So thanks, Len. And thank you, Susan, who really accommodated us despite the fact that I don't think I responded to any emails. <laughs> so 
Uh, it's pretty great, yeah. Um, so Justin and I have been working together for, uh, for a long time. We actually, we grew up together in Seattle. Um, so we've, uh, we've a long friendship and we found out we were both going to Yale. We're both pretty excited about that because we actually would know someone here, which is always, uh, always exciting when you're, uh, when you're going off to college. And uh, in college, uh, I remember, uh, so I was, I was a CA because uh, I always liked computers, but I actually didn't do uh, computer science for the first two years. Um, I took a bunch of Chinese. Uh, I thought I was going to be a chem major. Uh, turns out I really don't like chemistry lab. Uh, There's no and, chemistry professors here, though. Yeah. <laughs> if so, sorry. Uh, I clearly wasn't cut out for that. Um, and so actually the interesting thing was that by the time I uh, did computer science, it was almost more of a, uh, well, I need a major. And this looks like something I can do. So uh, I jumped on it. Um, because I think the most valuable thing I got out of Yale actually wasn't necessarily the, uh, it wasn't the, the classes per se or the, the specific educational opportunities. It was, it was the, the culture and the community I, that I was exposed to and part of. Uh, and so I was, we were hanging out with Justin. I remember, I remember when our first uh, moment of sort of entrepreneurialism happened around, uh, at, was actually at Yale, because uh, I was hanging out with Justin and Matt Fong, who's also an 05 grad from Brantford. Um, and uh, we were talking about what we we're going to do after college. And Matt, uh, Matt basically, it was a very intellectual argument, actually. It was like, yeah, he, this is the moment of most access to cheap intellectual capital we will ever have in our lives. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he, that's, he actually said that, and it kind of, that's the line that resonated with me. Yeah. Uh, he was like, we're, you, know, you're, you have an opportunity here to access all these smart people. We should do something about it, do something with that, and start a company. He wasn't inspired with a particular idea for a company, but he was like, we should start one. Yeah. Um, and we started having these conversations, and we got Emmett because he was the only, was, we thought it should be a technology company. For some reason, I can't remember where that came from, but um, Emmett was the only one we knew at. who was a programmer, or a computer science major, so we, need, we were like, okay, let's grab Emmett. <laughs> we started having these conversations, um, yeah. you know, kind of after dinner about like, what kind of company would yeah. we start. And so Gmail had just come out. Uh, here. Now Gmail seems like old hat. Like everybody uses web count, web email uh, these days. Uh, I mean, maybe some people here still use Outlook, but I feel like web email has really started taking over. But it was, it's hard to remember that in 2004, when, when Gmail first came out, it was a revelation, this idea that you could actually run great software uh, in the browser. We all had and, Horde, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah everyone yeah, had exactly. Horde here at, at the time. Was, yeah. I don't know if you guys still run that. Um, <laughs> okay. Just got retired. There we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, we took one look at Gmail and we said, this is awesome. There should be a calendar that works like this. And you know, of course, in retrospect, uh, Google, of course, realized exactly the same thing. It's not like that idea was original. And like maybe 11 other people started companies that were trying to build the web calendar that works like Gmail at the same time. Uh, but we were here and we didn't know that. So yeah. we were just the three of us thinking, OK, that sounds like a good idea. Let's try to build it. Let's, um, figure out how we can build a, a web calendar. So you start working on it yeah. on the back end, and I started, I remember just sitting in my dorm at Bram, you know, my, my room in Brantford, Googling uh, like JavaScript right. tutorials on how to <laughs> make something drag and drop online, you know, on the a web page, or yeah. you know, do various things that would make it look kind of like an Outlook calendar. Yeah, we, we basically made a Outlook clone in a web browser. I mean, it, it, we had some unique twists of our own, and it didn't look exactly like Outlook, but it was basically Outlook. It looked slightly worse than Outlook. It looked slightly worse than Outlook. <laughs> it looked significantly worse than Outlook, let's be honest. Yeah. It looked like my first w web JavaScript project. Yeah, it was. But, because it was my first web JavaScript project. <laughs> um, and we, uh, we, got, we, got, we got far enough along to have basically a rigged demo um, where you could use the functionality of the app, but you could use it exactly once. So yeah, this was, this was our senior year. It wasn't very robust software, and um, we had kind of been working on it between classes. I actually only yeah. had two classes, so. Yeah, that was good that planning. Was very helpful. And um, the whole, all of, we basically worked on it for maybe four or five months uh, between mm -hmm. the fall semester and then spring. And uh, we went through all the typical things that you do as a senior, you know, try to get a consulting yeah. job or a banking job <laughs> and um, line some jobs up. And then yeah. we didn't, you know, was, came closer and closer to graduation. We didn't really know what we were going to do with our 
startup. Yeah. I think we invested each like three hundred dollars in. Seed yeah, capital. yeah, we all put three hundred dollars in. And we spent we spent two hundred and fifty dollars on a domain for which turned out to be like the best investment that we made during the entire process. Yeah. So we bought Kiko.com. Uh, we we sent the owner an email and we we. We were, we, I remember we had the debate, should we spend $250 on Kiko.com? In retrospect, Kiko.com is probably worth like $100,000. Like, it's a four-letter pronounceable, like, easy, short domain name. Like, that's actually really valuable. But we, $250 is a lot of yeah. money when you're a college student. So we, uh, we had some trouble uh, stomaching that. But we wound up doing it. We pulled the trigger. We bought Kiko.com. Um, and then Paul Graham announced... Uh, his summer, what was it called? Summer, summer Founders, Founders Program. Reading program or something like that. Some, summer Founders Program. Yeah. So he had started this thing called Y Combinator and we had got an email one night in maybe, I think it was March or April, uh, from one of our friends who was in the computer science department and Paul Graham, who's a, uh, a startup founder and um, kind of essay, essayist. Um, he sold a company to Yahoo in the first dot-com boom. And then uh, he decided like that year in 2005 that he wanted to start funding some, doing some angel investments in small technology, you know, tech companies started by, you know, younger founders who are just getting started. And so he sent an email to the entire, like a bunch of different CS departments at a bunch of different colleges and said, I'm, you know, funding companies for the summer. Uh, so, you know, please apply if you're interested in starting a company at this uh, URL. And uh, we got it the night before the applications were due. Yeah, cr crushed out the application. Uh, it's like, it's actually, the application we submitted in 2005 is very similar to the applications you can still submit to Y Combinator today. Uh, the, it hasn't changed much. There's maybe one or two new questions. There's a video component now, but like, it's almost the same thing. So we sat down uh, and we just, and we, we had like, you know, six hours to do it. So we, uh, we put the application together, um, sent it off, and that was basically all the work we did to try to get funding for our company. Like, we didn't, it didn't even occur to us there were other ways to go get uh, money for your company. Um, we hadn't really grown up in that in that world, so uh, we got an email back. We got an email, yeah. Then a couple days later, and Paul said, "You know, there's there are a couple different types of companies that applied to our program. Uh, one is companies that had a great great founders who had a great idea. Uh, the second category was people who weren't that great that didn't have that great of an idea, and the third category was companies that uh, where the founders seemed okay, but their idea was really bad." And you guys were in the third category. <laughs> uh, so he said, would you be interested in coming to interview, uh, but would you be open to you know, an, doing something else, doing a new idea? And uh, we said, you know, yeah. of, of course, yeah, sure. sure, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so we fly out to... Uh, took the to, train up to, yeah. to Boston. Right? Oh, we took, yeah. Did we take the train up? Yeah, we, we took the train up. It, yeah. Wow, in yeah. my memory, it's, it's, we're flying, but we must be, must be... You're probably right. Anyway, so we, we took the train up to Boston, uh, stayed at La Quinta Inn uh, in Cambridge. Uh, Paul, uh, that's, where, that's where Paul, basically that's where Paul's house was. So he, uh, uh, and he was basically running YC out of his house, more or less. So uh, we came in, we got to interview. Um, it was like, a, there were like 40 minute interviews at the time. Um, these guys, I, I don't know if you guys know who Paul Graham and, and Robert Morris and uh, Trevor Blackwell are, but uh, if you were a, 21-year-old, 22-year-old computer science guy in 2005, they're your, like, internet heroes, um, almost certainly. Um, Paul's a great writer, and his, his, uh, his friends are actually also really amazing. They don't write as many essays, but they've done some really, truly astonishing work. Um, and so that was a really amazing experience for me to get to go and meet these people. That was great. Um, and it was sort of this blur of just, like, them asking questions and us defending, like, why this was a good idea. In retrospect, the questions they were asking were really on point, and like I don't, we were well, wrong. Well, but I, no, I don't. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Trevor kept arguing that there would never be this proliferation of JavaScript apps. That's true. That's true. And that like JavaScript, that was wrong. yeah, web, like smart web apps would never be something that was you know popular on on the internet. And yeah. I think we were vindicated in. We the were end. vindicated there. Yeah. The question about the business. Yeah, there was no business. There was so. no business. But anyway, so we, we went on. We worked on uh, Keo Calendar for a while. Uh, so we, they funded. They funded, they funded us. us. They funded us. It was great. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, just, we moved to we moved to Roxbury in in in, yeah. um, in uh, Boston, and we decided to give back our you know, starting bonuses for our uh, the jobs that we had lined up, and we, we were like, okay, we're going full in on internet um, startup. Yeah. And uh, the so we weren't very good founders when we started uh, Kiko. We had no idea what we were doing. We had like basically ADD. So. We would work on Kiko for like a month, and then we'd be like get distracted by a new shiny, awesome idea, and we go work on that for like three weeks, and then realize that like 
the shininess had worn off, and it was actually a lot of hard work, like the original idea. And then we go back to working on Kiko, and we sort of repeated that cycle like four times um, or five times. Yeah, a lot of times. A lot of times. It was it was a lot of times. We, we had a lot of cool. St- it was like a, sort of like a master's class in writing web startups, though, because like it turns out if you crank out new prototypes every three weeks for a new product or a new service, you get really good at doing that uh, quickly and like cranking out new features, cranking out new products. Um, so, so that was cool. Yeah. During this time, like Emmett had basically. He you know, was supposed to be the computer scientist and you know, web developer expert, and I was like the, you know, his apprentice, basically learning how to program. But Emmett was really just like one step ahead of me in, right. the, like, in the textbook. Because Yale has a really amazing um, computer science program uh, if you care a lot about the theory. Uh, and, I, and I did, actually. And the great thing about learning the theory is that once you learn the theory, you can, in fact, go teach yourself the practical stuff in a matter of six months, because it's all just tr- kind of trivial applications of the theory. It does take you like six months. So I spent about six months uh, bumbling around, not really having any idea what I was doing at a practical level, and uh, uh, trying to stay one step ahead of Justin, uh, who was quickly gaining on me. And so it was uh, sort of this, uh, you know, it's like a pretty typical story for most new startups, which is, you know, people who didn't really know what they were doing, uh, a little bit over their head, but trying to, you know, basically figuring it out along the way. So we basically had a year of boot camp of building different web applications, trying to um, see if they would like immediately explode when we release them in the wild, and then inevitably, be, inevitably being disappointed when they didn't. And so we uh, came around. It was we'd been working on it for about a year, and we were like, okay, we need to. We're running out of money, and we're yeah. like, we need to do something else. Something's yeah. like not working. Well, and also Google Google Calendar came out and kind yeah. of took some of the wind out of our sails. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we sold Kiko. Uh, we sold Kiko on eBay. Actually, we just put the startup up for sale. Uh, in auction, we figured we could get the market price for it that way. We were like, we could get, you know, we wanted to get enough money that we could pay back our investors and, yeah. and not feel that we had like just kind of blown all this money. They yeah. raised about seventy thousand dollars, which seemed like a huge amount to us at the time to, to invest in two, you know, college students. But now it's like, I think that's laughable. Yeah. Um, and so we we decided, like, let's list it on eBay and see what happens. Yeah. And um, luckily, what happened was we basically got a, a bunch of tech press around um, in the fledgling kind of tech press industry. We got a bunch of news that was like, these guys are crazy and they're selling their startup on, on eBay. And so that got a lot of attention and a lot of people heard, heard about it. And we were not sure we would even get one bid, um, but we got a bid. And then we, you know, I remember the morning of um, the sale finishing, uh, the, the, the auction would end. Uh, we were in New York at some of our Yale friends' um, apartments. and. Uh, Every time we would refresh this eBay page, the auction price would go up like fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> so we were like, it was kind of working. We'd like refresh and then went like remember to eighty-five thousand. I was like, that's great because we're going to actually make some money. money. Yeah. You know, we'll make we'll each make like five thousand dollars, <laughs> which is like more than we'd paid ourselves at any time during the entire course of the year. Yeah. And uh, then we re- refreshed again. We go like hundred to like one fifty, and eventually it, it ended at two hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars. And we were like, we're we're geniuses. We have a <laughs> successful startup. <laughs> Yeah. Win. This is like um, a, a new business model. Yeah. Um, yeah, make, make a quick startup and then flip it on eBay. No, no problem. It, so other people have tried this since, by the way. Don't, don't try this. It worked the first time because it was uh, weird and unheard of, and so it got a lot of press, uh, and so it was actually an effective way to get the word out and to sell it. The second time you do it, it's just a copy, and then no one talks about it, and then it's not exciting anymore. Uh, so. Uh, it worked once. It was, uh, it was actually, I think in some ways that's what gave us the idea uh, for the next startup because it, was, it worked because it was a ridiculous stunt. And that was, I think, uh, a lesson we took with us to, to Justin TV, um, which is the idea Justin had to put his life on the internet 24 7. Why, why did you want to do <laughs> Justin TV? So we had this idea for, for, well, I say we, but I'm trying to sh- share some of the blame with Emmett. <laughs> um, but we, when we were trying to figure out how to get out of Kiko and, and sell it, we had a bunch of different conversations about things we might do with it. And at one point, I was like, these conversations are kind of interesting. Maybe we could create some sort of podcast or something, like a live audio stream of this. And there was no, I don't, I don't think podcasts were around at the time, but um, it was kind of like that. And then that turned into a live audio stream, turned into a live video stream, which turned into a live reality show that was 24-7. Most people wouldn't make that last. You know? <laughs> but... Uh, so we were like, I was kind of excited about this idea. I thought it would be a good way to like meet people and um, might be fun. And so we, I can, you know, basically 
after we were very disheartened at the end of you know kind of when we were selling Kiko, but after we actually sold it, I think we felt a lot better about the past year. You know, we each had yeah. a couple, uh, you know, thirty grand or so in our bank accounts, and we were like, okay, that was like that was pretty good. We basically made what we would have made if we actually worked at a job, except yeah. all the money at once at, at the end end. when you couldn't spend it. Because we we made like you know probably like seventeen thousand dollars over the course of the year each in total, like you know. Paychecks, yeah. uh, living very much hand to mouth, slowly eroding our savings. It's actually they should make all college students do this for two years, uh, right after you graduate. Is like you get paid the normal amount, but then you don't get to spend any of it, and then at the end you have this big chunk of money saved up. Uh, because, at least for us, the uh, the upside of that was it gave us this freedom. We had like months where we could just like not work and figure out what we wanted to do next, um, and that was that was actually extremely freeing. So we wanted to start a startup, and, and we uh, again our next startup, and we went to Paul's house again, uh, and we said, "Okay, we Paul, we have this idea." And the idea that we actually had to pitch him was um, it was kind of like a page layout software. If you had internet content, you could import your blog and then lay it out, and then create like a book. Like we would print a book for you, or, or you know, books for your friends. And we said, "Paul, you know, you have all these essays online. Would you want to use something like this?" And he was like, no. "Absolutely not." <laughs> it's like I wouldn't use that. That's stupid. <laughs> He's like, what else do you have? What other ideas for businesses do you have? And well, so, we do have this one idea. So what like, if we put Justin's life on the internet 24-7 as a reality television show? And Paul's response to his credit was, interesting, tell me more. Um, <laughs> and so the, the objection was, but this is just like one reality TV show. It's not an internet startup. That's like a TV show. Uh, that's like, uh, you're going to be reality television producers, not technology people. And we're like, no, 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 it's, it's cool. We're going to have like 10 TV shows. We're going like, to open this up as a platform and have the next breed of reality television on our platform. Um, and and that, was, that was sufficient to uh, convince him to cut us a $50,000 check to invest, in, uh, uh, <laughs> to invest in the Justin TV project. I think he believed in us, to, to his, yeah. you know, not, not necessarily the project. But, yeah. uh, uh, and Robert, Robert Morris was there at the same time as well. I believe his quote at the moment was, uh, I'm, I'm happy for us to fund this just to watch you make fools of yourselves. Yep. Um, which, which, Famous you know, computer science professor. Yeah. It, you know, his, his prediction was correct. You know, we, we did look pretty foolish on camera, uh, not, not in often. So we walked out of there with a check, and we, didn't, we, we were like, OK, we have our second business is funded. And now we just need to figure out how to produce this show, like how we could possibly create this live stream from like all over a city. Um, we didn't know. There was no iPhone at the time. It was, still 2000, it was about 2006, a year after we graduated. And so we started doing some research. And um, we ended up recruiting two more co-founders for our team. Uh, Michael, who was also a Yale student, 05. Uh, Michael Seibel, Mike, uh, one of my friends from Brantford. Uh, he had been working at a, um, s- uh, like a senatorial race campaign as a head of finance. We were like, we need someone who's like a business guy to kind of uh, you know, figure out how to like, do the business side of this show, which was like, very undefined. That was as much as it was defined. And so he came and, and joined us, and we recruited Kyle, who was a. Uh, we, we were like, okay, we needed someone to create this hardware to stream, to make this like live streaming camera. Um, MIT has people who know about hardware. So we just emailed an MIT, the MIT EECS list and said, you know, does anyone know? Like, we're looking for a hardware hacker to join us. We're successful entrepreneurs who have created this, you know, <laughs> Kiko. <laughs> and uh, so Kyle was sufficiently snookered and they, he yeah. responded to our job ad and, yeah. and he kind of joined us as uh, the fourth founder. Yeah. And we, uh, uh, so we all moved out to San Francisco, uh, set up shop in this little tiny two bedroom apartment for the four, four dudes uh, all living together and, and started making the show. Um, and, and like the eBay auction, this is something that was a good idea once uh, and it blew up because we were doing something kind of audacious and crazy which is we we're gonna put someone's life on the internet 24 seven uh, no one's ever done that, so we got we got all this mainstream media attention. We got uh, we got Justin on like the like Today morning show, shows, the Today Show, and good, yeah, good Today morning America, show, Good Morning America, MTV. Yeah. yeah, and so like it was it was awesome, right? Like we actually I felt like we were like king of the world for like three months of like running the show. It's like we were it was like exploding. We were getting all this traffic, all this attention, and uh, and then we realized that like actually no one was sticking around because the content was really boring. So people. <laughs> People, um, they liked it. They, the idea of like someone broadcasting their life, life to the internet, and we had no business model at this point. We were like, we'll get sponsorships or something. The one sponsorship we managed to get was from Ball's Energy Drink. <laughs> and it was for no money. It was just for free An entire energy entire pallet drink. of Ball's. Yeah. It's huge. 
We made this giant pyramid out of them. It was yeah. like it was like this tall, like a, this pyramid of, of balls energy. They sent us like several thousand dollars. Zipcar of... sponsored us too. Oh yes, also not for any money. Not for any money. Just but... for free Zipcar, which they actually canceled after the first like week. Yeah, because we, we we let someone else drive the yeah, Zipcar. Yeah, we were abusing our, our sponsorship. The so uh, the the business wasn't really working out, but it, people we were getting a lot of attention. And uh, at the same time, we were accruing a lot of like ho hosting bills for all of our bandwidth costs, and we, you know, we realized that like like Emmett said, like we weren't, you know, people would come on and they would say, "Get off your computer and go entertain us." Like you, what you're doing, you guys are really boring. What are you doing? Um, and we were weren't very good at producing video. We had no media experience. We had yeah. no video production experience. We were just like, you know, more on the engineering side, I would say. Yeah. Um, so we we ended up. Uh, getting luckily, the pe people when they came to the site, they gave us you know one additional piece of feedback aside from you guys are extremely boring, which was we want to create I want to create my own live stream of uh, something like a bike race or a you know comedy show or whatever. How do I how do I do that? How did you guys do this? So the light bulb kind of went off. Oh right, we should just like make this a platform and like let other people make the content since we know about making websites and other people might know about making the uh, good content. Um, and so we did that and that worked much better. Um, that that was sort of the directly led into this phase of Justin TV's life where it really was just it's kind of blowing up um, and that was really fun. We ra we raised money. Uh, we went from you know I think negative net worth at one point when when we had more hosting bills than we could li literally money in the bank account. So we like had to raise money, raised money, uh, paid off our hosting bills, uh, and started uh, really growing. Um, and that was great. That was a uh, a whole new set of problems and challenges to learn about, um, which I think. Uh, we were also unprepared for, but less unprepared for than we had been for the uh, uh, to get started in the very first place. And it was it was great because we uh, uh, we got to hire people, we got to learn how to like actually do management, uh, we got to learn how to deal with things like scaling, how to how to deal with uh, you know your servers falling over uh, repeatedly. And that's one of those things that uh, it's a kind of a high class problem actually. By the time you're reaching that phase as a startup, you have actually already achieved a certain level of success. Um, and those are sort of the second order problems you then start running into. There were all these, you know, it, I mean, that, that makes it sound a lot more glamorous than I think it, it actually was. We basically were constantly worried about, we, we, we spent six months building the platform after the show, and then I remember lots of people, like after, you know, years later, people were like, oh, you had this, did this show as a promotion for your platform, right? Um, which would have been a smart way to go about it, but that was completely wrong. <laughs> We, we actually weren't that smart, even though YouTube was already popular and had been sold to Google by that time. So yeah. there, was, there was kind of a, you know, we should have known, I guess. Uh, but, but no, we spent six months building this platform and then we launched it and like I said, it was accelerating and we raised a couple million dollars in venture for the idea of this um, platform. And I remember there were lots of times that it was just extremely stressful. It was like, you know, multiple years of like, the, the website would grow until it like completely fell over and broke. Um, and then we'd have to like spend a month trying to un unbreak our, our horrible bottlenecks. Uh, we spent, I remember, yeah. days like in the servers, like racking servers, and then like moving them ourselves to like different data centers to try to make it work. I and remember there was, there was there was a period of about two years where I would be paged every single weekend uh, because something would break, like every weekend, every every Saturday or Sunday. And usually, so we had a lot of European users, and so peak usage would come at like six a.m. on Saturday. Uh, and so I got a lot of 6 a.m. Saturday pages. Uh, but like, that was a, it, it was stressful and there was like, it was like a lot of gr grunt work, but like, I felt like, for, at least for me, I was always felt very motivated during that period because we were like growing. Yep. And in the end, when your startup is growing, you always feel good about it. Um, you always feel like you have a direction and purpose in life, which is to make this number continue to go up. Um, yep, numbers going up is a... Numbers, yeah, yeah. it's huge. Uh, and so that actually worked for a long time. We got Justin TV. Uh, fairly large. Uh, we started figuring out how to make some money. Um, got it to you know more or less break even to the point where it was you know it was we weren't bleeding to death uh, with cash all over the, everywhere all the all the time. One of the things was that you couldn't in by two thousand eight you couldn't raise any money for video startups. So people had seen YouTube, and then instead of being like oh we could create more hits like that, um, all the investors in YouTube were like I don't want to invest in this business, and everyone else was like I you know kind of followed suit and so we were unable to raise any more money really from any right. new investors and we just spent we a lot of time trying to lower our costs and like do things more efficiently and more cheaply which i think really contributed ultimately to our 
you know, yeah. being su su set up for success in the later. Yeah. So then we got reached this point where Justin TV wasn't really growing anymore, but it was a stable, success, I mean, successful business. It wasn't that huge, but it was, it was around. It could pay its employees. It wasn't in imminent danger of, of going out of business or anything like that. And we, uh, we were trying to decide what to do next. And we had two Skunk Works projects internally, um, one around mobile and one around gaming. And uh, the idea at the time was like, grow Justin TV mobile, grow Justin TV gaming, find a way to grow Justin TV into a new direction. Yeah, we were flat and we, we didn't know, we, we knew we wanted to be bigger. We had a, about a 20 something person company that was you know, barely profitable and we we're like, okay, let's, if without a new project, if, if something's not growing on the internet, it's declining. Like basically things are, the internet is, is growing and if things aren't, like if you're not something that's, if you're something that people want to use, then the number of people who will actually use it is probably increasing. And so we were like, could see the writing on the wall and, and Justin TV didn't seem like it was, you know, a thing that was going to continue to grow. So we spent a lot of time debating amongst the founders. We had yeah. what, I, what I like to call a <laughs> Yale culture, where yes. everyone wanted input. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, we had, so, so Kyle would complain, complain bitterly of the, the, the Yale argument, which was me, Michael, and Justin, like, just like hashing it out for you know, four hours to figure out what the right conclusion would be. And uh, there's some like, really great upsides to doing it that way, but for a business, there's also a lot of downsides to having that approach. Um, and so, uh, one of the things we did that I think was, was smart when we made this transition is we sort of more clearly delineated leadership in the company so that uh, everyone sort of had an area they owned and we stopped trying to have all four people make a decision by consensus, which is like not a good way to make uh, quick decisions. So what we did was we, we brainstormed ideas for what we could work on that we thought might you know, grow bigger than Justin TV and those two things like Emmett said were mobile and gaming. And so we kind of divided the company into a couple teams, basically one big team that was working on Justin TV, one small team that was working on the gaming uh, content that was on, on Justin TV that Emmett right. was working on, and one other small part that um, was working on the mobile uh, side of it that Michael and I were kind of working on. And uh, we got some great advice at the time from another Yale alum who's in technology, Matt Sanchez, was running Say Media, and he had pivoted his company that he started at Yale, which, uh, Video Egg, several times into new directions and always kind of continued, which was pretty inspiring, you know, like most people don't survive one, one pivot, <laughs> let it alone, like I think he's pivoted three or four times and now has a quite successful company. And uh, I asked him, like, how did you do it? And he advised us to set goals before we actually started so that we could, you know, know if we were, um, like hold ourselves accountable kind of to like a decision, uh, that we had made you know, beforehand. So yeah. we kind of set some goals for growth on what we would like these projects to, to how we would like them to grow um, if they were gonna be successful over the next six months and then figured we would reevaluate in six months and, and uh, see what had happened. Yeah. And if we had you know, one, one project made it and they hit those goals then we would just focus on that. If neither uh, you know, happened or made it, then we wouldn't be any worse off than we were at that point. And if yeah. both worked, then <laughs> like, it's a good problem to have. Right. And so, of course, naturally, like the case we didn't really plan for, the both work case happened. Um, and uh, we were trying to figure out what to do with that. And we wound up spinning off Social Cam, actually. So we did something that is one of those things that I always advise startups not to do, which is we actually ran a formal spinoff process and literally, like, you know, dividended out shares and got to learn all about the intricacies of uh, spinning, doing company spinoffs, which is something we didn't know anything about. Uh, but uh, that actually wound up being really successful. Social Cam went on to uh, blow up using uh, Facebook integration and uh, wound up getting bought by Autodesk for $60 million like four months later. So that was, that was great. Uh, Michael, Michael went, up, went, went with that company, uh, sold it. Uh, Justin, Justin stick, stuck around with, with me. And we, uh, uh, we started working on the gaming thing. And the gaming thing was uh, basically we're going to have people watch video games on the internet. And I knew this was something that was cool because it was something I liked doing. Um, it was the, the content on Justin TV that I enjoyed. And so... Uh, the real light bulb moment for me with, with Twitch, um, which wasn't called Twitch at the time, it was just called Justin TV Gaming, was when I actually realized, and this is one of those, those things that everyone tells you when you're starting a company, go talk to your users and like, understand their problems, understand who they are and like, what they need. And I think I told myself I was doing that before, but I wasn't. And when we actually started doing that, we actually went out there and talked to people who were gonna be using the product and really learned what their problems were. Uh, we suddenly like, the company was transformed in the sense that we weren't any more productive than we were before, but the things we were making, people actually wanted. Um, and it was 
it's just sort of night and day in terms of growth rate and success for uh, for Twitch, and I really credit it to to, to that process, to really learning what. Uh, what the users really needed. I think we had like never talked to a user actually in the entire course of Justin TV, like starting from the beginning where we would see, does anyone want to actually watch Justin's life, right? No one, right. No one would have said yes. Yeah. Um, it, like eventually, we had built many different kind of spin-off or like side projects or projects that were intended to accelerate Justin TV's growth, but the only thing that had ever worked was really just having live video plus chat and enabling other people to create content. Yeah. But we had created like a live, video thing for Twitter and a yeah. uh, CDN for like a kind of like a white label live video solution that other people could use. Uh, um, we made a, a online video dares thing we called challenges, <laughs> which became the watchword for bad failed projects at the company. Um, and, and they were all, what they all had in common was we hadn't actually talked to anyone about whether they would want to use the service or not before we launched it. Um, and I, it's, it's, it's like super embarrassing, right? But, uh, I guarantee you there are, are you know, so if anyone here is starting a company or has ever worked on a product you launch internally, even at Yale, I guarantee you at least half of you have not talked to your user before you launched it. Um, because it's just, it's just incredibly common. Um, and uh, uh, it's also very, it is very embarrassing. But uh, we finally got it. We finally figured out what we were doing. Five wrong. years in. Five years in. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and then we started working on, uh, working on Twitch. And that that actually, the story with Twitch is actually kind of boring in the sense that the, the cycle is very simple. You talk to the users, you figure out what they need, you build stuff for them, you get more users, and you go talk to them again. You should explain what, it, like what people are actually doing. So, so the way Twitch actually works is uh, you have these like, top video game players in the world. You can imagine the best you know, Street Fighter player in the world. And they'll go on, uh, and they'll play video games, they'll broadcast that video game, other people can watch them playing that video game. and They'll take questions from the audience. Uh, they'll talk about what's going on. They'll give commentary. And uh, there's sort of two kinds of successful streamers on Twitch. You have the, the best players in the world who you watch because they're just, their skills are truly astonishing. They do things in these video games that if you've ever played the video game, you can't really believe is humanly possible um, because they're just that good. They're that much faster. They can, they can, an average person can do 60 actions in a minute in a video game. They can do 280. Right? They're, they're that much better than normal. And uh, then there's another class of users who maybe aren't that good at video games, but they're like almost like stand-up comedians. They're, they're just really personable, really passionate. interesting, really passionate about video games. And they're there to talk to the audience and interact with them. And the video games are the medium, but it's more like a variety show uh, than it is like uh, you know, ESPN or a sports documentary. And sort of, it's, so it's this blend of all these different kinds of video game content. And it's really open to to any gaming content, right? So we have poker on the site now. We've got Magic the Gathering. I don't know if you guys remember Magic the Gathering. It's a card game still going strong. Um, and we've got sort of this whole breadth of content on the site. Uh, but it's all around gaming. And it's turned out that there's this huge community of gamers because everyone's a gamer now. I mean, if, you know, in this audience, uh, the number of you who, if you have a smartphone, you've probably played a game on it at some point. Like at this point, pretty much everyone plays some amount of video games. And increasingly, we see uh, our audience expanding into all, you know, all these different games. So like when we started off though, and really on Emmett was starting off working on it, it was very divided within the company whether this was a thing or not, right? Most people I see like looks of complete baffle, bafflement and bewilderment um, around the audience today. And like if you aren't a gamer or you don't play, haven't played these games, and even many people who had at the time, this was you know, three, or three and a half years ago, they were like, that is not a thing. That's not something that people want to do. I don't understand any context for why anyone would want to do this. I remember in the beginning, you didn't like watching yeah, live streams. I, I played video, video games, games, but I didn't, even, I didn't watch. And Emmett had convinced me, but my other two co-founders definitely was like, were, were like, that is not going to be a thing. It's the stupidest idea. Yeah. And I mean, you, you, know, you never know. I mean, in, in, and so uh, the thing that really helped, I think, was setting some... We, we, I remember we sat down and we said, okay, here's our goals, and if we do achieve this growth every month for the next first two years, then we will get to become the largest video game website. And that was like, you know, that's a, a pretty big site, but it's not, you know, even anywhere. Twitch has, con, you know, kind of grew at a much, much faster rate. And so that gave us the confidence six months in to kind of pivot the entire company towards uh, gaming, which, you know, this, yeah. what Emmett was, was working on. And um, I, mean, I think it, yeah. you, certainly when you, it's, it's one thing to say, oh, it's growing quickly, and say, okay, we, sh we should go invest more in this. Another thing to have said in advance, hey, if we can grow this 25% a month for six months, that means we should invest in it. It's much easier to get everyone's buy-in at that point. 
Um, so today there's, you know, gaming, Twitch uh, eventually became a, its own site separate from Justin TV and that brand has, you know, grown and grown and grown. It's 55 million yeah. viewers every month now around the world watch Twitch content. Uh, a 60. million, 60 million, 60 million. It's a new number. As, um, a million people broadcast every yep. month. Yep. Uh, the big, it's the biggest live streaming site in the United States. Uh, it's the fourth biggest user of bandwidth in North America. Um, the T yeah. company is 190 people. Yeah. Um, and then a month ago, we sold, it was acquired by Amazon for $970 million. Um, yeah. me, I think the, uh, for me, the, the best part about talking to Amazon recently has been uh, so someone asked me actually before before we got on stage, you know, what's changed uh, since you guys bought, got bought by Amazon? And I thought about it, um, and the answer is really right now. Uh, there's the the only thing that's changed short run so far is we had to switch our uh, payroll provider. We went from uh, Paychex to ADP. Uh, I'm not entirely pleased. <laughs> uh, the uh, long run, I mean, the we're, you know we're still very much going to operate it independently. I mean, one of the reasons I was excited is I got to stay the CEO. I get to keep running uh, Twitch, uh, which is something I really enjoy. Um, and uh, the, uh, the best part about being part of Amazon is we actually, I just never have to raise money again. Um, so I think that that's probably my least favorite part of being an entrepreneur. So It's like professional uh, begging. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, uh, that's actually a really good description. I never yeah. thought of it that way. Um, but uh, I, I get to just go to my, I have a boss now, which is something I've never had before, which is kind of interesting. But I get to, I get to my boss and say, hey, I, I, want, I want money. I, we have this thing we want to do. And then they either give it to me or they don't. But it's great. Uh, I never have to go like, uh, down to Sand Hill Road again. Um, Sand Hill Road is where all the uh, venture capitalists live. Or, or when, we, when we, were raising, we were able to raise some money from uh, All Stop Louis Partners for Justin TV and then a little bit of follow on in 2008, right before the market crashed. But after that, you know, it was very hard to raise money, especially like, including when you know, Twitch had like, early signs of growth. You know, we, yeah. uh, Emmett was able to raise another $30 million, or there about $35 million for the company. But, uh, which sounds like a lot actually, but um, it, it was very hard, I yeah. think, to convince like, people that gaming was something to invest we, in. We had a lot of meetings. Like raising money, uh, especially for a gaming startup and for a gaming video startup, was, was very much not easy. Um, and I felt like each time we managed to raise money, but only by the skin of our teeth. So it was not a. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't an awesome process, and you know, selling a company isn't an awesome process either. But at least once you've done that, you're done with it. Um, you don't have to do it again. Uh, you know, a year and a half or two years later. Cool. Well, that's yeah. pretty much the story up to date today. Yeah. Uh, so we'll. Yeah, any any, we any have questions? Open up to questions. Without Yale, we would yeah. not be here. So yeah. we're pretty thankful. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so the name Twitch. Well, the question was, where did you get the name Twitch? Yeah, you yeah. should tell them some of the early names. Yeah. So originally, Twitch was going to be called Zarth.com um, <laughs> because we'd we'd bought the Zarth.com domain name, and I love code names, so I'd code name the project Zarth. Um, and actually, we picked Zarth because it was a name I think no one was comfortable with, uh, which meant that otherwise the code name tends to stick, and you just launch with it. Um, so uh, Twitch came about because we told all the reporters we were launching at E3 in 2011, and we told all the reporters uh, the name is secret. Uh, we, will, we don't want it to leak, so we'll tell it to you uh, just before launch, and you can put it in your story. And it was getting to like two days to the point before we were going to tell them, and we still didn't have a name. And so I like locked myself in a closet for like two days straight. Uh, we had this like tiny closet conference room in our uh, in our old office, and uh, and just looked up names that. Had the cross section of like vaguely related gaming, so fast twitch gaming is the sort of the etymology of it, um, where I could also buy the domain name. We couldn't get twitch.com, but we got twitch.tv, which is close enough, and uh, uh, we wound up running with that just because all the alternatives seemed worse. Um, in retrospect, it's worked out really well. It's been a really good name. It's a great name. Um, and, uh, but it, you know, uh, it de definitely had mixed reviews at the company when it was announced. Yeah, I think I hated it in the beginning. Yeah. I remember, most, most, yeah. people, most, most names people hate the first time they hear them. But I also hated YouTube, so what yeah. do I know? Exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. We're over there in the, in the back. Yeah. So I was actually interested to hear about what happened to Kiko.com under new management. It, it, it was bought. So under, under new management, Kiko was bought by two cows. 
And two cows idea is they're going to uh, buy, they, they sell software to ISPs and they're going to buy uh, Kiko and uh, white label the calendar software and uh, sell it to ISPs to give to their customers as sort of like a value add uh, for people who are, because uh, they, they already sold white label email software. Um, and I just think it never, that project never wound up getting off the ground. I don't, I don't think they ever actually sold it. Yeah, I'm not sure. They definitely shut down the public facing yeah. version. I just, I just looked it up, and now it's labeled as the ultimate web startup page. Oh, well, maybe. <laughs> Amazing. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is, yeah. <laughs> the cycle I continues. Knew it was worth exploring. That sounds like another interesting branch of the story. <laughs> yeah, I don't, actually, we lost track of it after we sold it. I don't know. Down here. Yeah. that really resonated with me. Uh, rapid prototyping, sort of the, the notion of iterative development surfacing the work early and often, and then how your light bulb moment for Twitch was authentic engagement with the user base. I was hoping that you'd be able to talk a little bit about the process, particularly around the latter, of uh, wh what kind of steps did you take, what was your process like of engaging with the users and really sort of teasing out the, the, the details that, uh, that you missed up to that point? Yeah, so I mean, the, the sad thing is it's actually really easy. Uh, you sit down with them and you're like, hey, you know, how's it going? Like, what, what do you do? Like, what services do you use today? Like do you, bro like, do you do this for a living? Do you not? Like, do you tell me about yourself? And you just, like, you engage them like you would with any, any human. You sort of ask them, you know, well, do you, what games do you play? What, what are your favorite? What do you broadcast? Why do you broadcast those games? And you just sort of, whenever they say something, the, you follow up with the question of, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. And if, it turns out people have talked about themselves. So if you just keep asking, they'll keep telling you. And the hard part, actually, is identifying who to talk to. Because um, you, know, you have to decide who your users are, and that's sort of scary. Uh, I think one of the re reasons we didn't do it before is we wanted to say, oh, everyone's our user. Like, everyone will use this calendar. It's for everyone. Yeah. And that's like a big flashing like red warning light. Uh, but, uh, but it, yeah, fundamentally, there, there is, I, it's, I, it's hard to give a tip or a trick for it because there isn't, there's really nothing to it other than talking to your users with a real open mind and really asking them, what, what, do, you, what do you want, what do you need? You know, on the, on the prototyping side, I think there's, I do definitely believe in doing, uh, building prototypes and building the thing, things quickly. But the, uh, the most important part about that for us was we thought really hard about how do we, uh, how do we get to something that's like actually good and actually focusing more on building good, the smallest good thing was much more important to us than getting out the maximum number of things. And that was another sort of uh, mindset twitch, mindset switch for <laughs> Twitch. Well, tell, tell them about the um, kind of the, feature, the first features that really broadcasters wanted, the game oh, broadcasters yeah. wanted. So we, we went and talked to a bunch of the gaming broadcasters and uh, so what they told us was, uh, your service is bad because uh, the video is low quality. Um, and we were like, oh, that's, that's disappointing to hear. We think we have high quality video. Uh, <laughs> why, why, why do you think that? And they're like, well, whenever I broadcast, my viewers are always complaining about how the video like, stutters and like, stops. And we're like, that just means they don't have enough bandwidth to watch your stream. You're broadcasting it too high of quality, actually. Um, but like, you can't tell people that. So what we what we did instead, actually, is we built a live, I think it was a, the first of its kind, a live transcoding system that actually reduced the quality of the video. Uh, and then the complaints all went away. Um, because, because it turns out that the problem, in fact, wasn't anything about us having low quality video. It was actually that we didn't offer low enough quality video to enable it to be watched by people uh, with uh, less amounts of bandwidth. And that's, uh, uh, that's sort of the classic case of, you know, don't ask users what they want. Uh, talk to them about what their needs and what their goals are, uh, because then you can kind of figure out the right solution to that problem. Um, they usually don't know. How, yeah. how, how does what you've just said about market research and, and rapid prototyping compare or contrast with, with um, the, the concept of a minimum viable product? And yeah. Do you have an opinion um, on that? So, I mean, mar market research is all well and good. I feel like whenever someone says, market research, I, I tend to run screaming from the room because the, the, there's like more, more than one kind of way of doing market research. And I think the, the thing that, at least for me, has always really worked uh, is really just talking to users. And if you try to do the research by re 
typical, what you get taught research looks like in school, uh, you, you wind up getting really, it's how we used to do our, our market research, right? Um, and I think that was, that was a big mistake. For minimum viable pro product though, I think, you know, you bring, get this data in and the goal is, the goal is not to build uh, the fastest minimal thing you can out into the market. It's to build, it's to not do extra work on your way to a thing that actually solves the problem. Like a thing that produces one, I think the, the phrase at YC is one quantum of utility, right? One discrete unit of utility for your users. Uh, that's what you want to build first. And sometimes the thing that produces one discrete quantum of utility for your users is, uh, is a really tiny project you can hack it out in three days. And sometimes it, in the case of Dropbox, for example, uh, the minimum viable product took them, I think, like a year and a, a year. half. It took a them year. a year to launch Dropbox. A year to launch yeah. Dropbox, right? And that's, but the fact was, that was the minimum viable product. You couldn't get to one faster than that and still have it be truly actually viable. Um, and that's the, uh, that's the thing. There's no, there's no like, correct recipe for it. You really, have to, you really do have to think for yourself on, on each of those uh, topics. Hi, so um, I guess going back to the user testing, um, average about like, I guess six users is usually a good number to ask, but when you guys were developing your product throughout the different phases, like how many users did you guys talk to throughout the yeah. whole process to get a good feel of who your So we did user testing all the time mm -hmm. with Justin TV. Um, user testing is where you build, a, you build something yeah. and then you run users through it uh, and you like notice where the sore points in the UR, UX are and you find out where people get stuck in the flow, where people are confused. Um, and user testing has its place. It's certainly useful. As you said, five or six people usually gets you pretty much all the data you need there. Um, user testing and, and talking to users are very, very different. We did a ton of user testing and we learned nothing about what our users really wanted or needed um, because by the time you're doing user testing, you're asking them to engage with your solution. Your solution's already baked. You already know what you're, what you're proposing to them. The user research stuff that I'm suggesting is happens far earlier in the process. It happens before you, not only before you come up with this solution to this problem, it's how you discover what the problems actually are. Um, and so I think it's, you know, user testing has its place. Um, most startups don't fail because their UX or their like checkout flow isn't good enough. Most startups fail because no one actually wants what they made. Like if, 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 if the stuff thing you make is good, if people really like it, if they really want it, it they will a big figure it out. You, yeah, yeah they, they'll, they'll figure out whatever. Like, even if your product is terrible at getting it to them. I mean, you've all had this experience. You probably like, subscribe to Comcast. You really want internet access, <laughs> right? And like, it's not the easiest to get it set up. It's not the most fun, but you'll jump through whatever hoops you need to because you really want and need this thing that they're selling and they're the only ones who can sell it to you. Um, and that's, the, that's, the, that's where the position you want to be in, honestly. I mean, you, you may not want to treat your customers exactly the way they do, but like, you, but you do, you, you, you want to be in, that, you want to be in a product, yeah. you want to be in a position where you can sell this thing that no one else can offer that is just really great. Um, and the reason that people will, and, and that the rest, of the rest of your product doesn't really matter that much. It's still, you should still make it nice. You should still work on it. But like user testing tends to be a sort of a second phase thing after you've already solved the more core central problem, which is, you know, does anyone actually want this thing? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I actually had a question about um, Twitch itself has basically made the expansion of esports huge. Thank you, by the way. Um, You're welcome. But I'm curious, it, due to like League of Legends, 200 million people at three in the morning U.S. watching it on Twitch, 50 million people watching Dota on Twitch. Are you guys planning on expanding further into the esports market at all, or are yeah. you just going to keep it on? Live broadcast. So, so we we really believe in the esports market. For those of you who don't know, at esports, esports is sort of this concept of playing video games as sports. Um, and actually, it's it's great. We've seen a lot of really great progress there. Not only do we, you know, are we selling out Staples Center, selling out Madison Square Garden, um, but uh, we aren't. Our, our partners are. But like esports is. Uh, when I say I'm using the royal we, I suppose here. But like uh, the the uh, the thing about esports is we at Twitch want to support that one. We want to help grow it. And we think it's got this potential to be absolutely massive. Um, and the way, the role we see ourselves playing there is uh, being that platform that enables anyone to produce great uh, esports content and being there to help find them sponsorships, help find them 
visas so they can get into the country, right? That's actually a big problem. Uh, if you're an athlete and you're trying to you know, attend the Olympics, there's actually a special visa you can get uh, to attend sports competitions. Um, getting that to apply uh, to esports athletes is, a, is, a, is something important. Actually, Riot Games has done a great job uh, pushing that forward for League of Legends, and we want to help push it forward across the board. Looking at things like athletic scholarships, well, should there be an e-athletic scholarship? You know, how can we make that happen? We've actually run a program like that um, in the past. Um, I will say Matt Fong, uh, our co-founder, um, when he got his job, he wound up going to Goldman because actually due to visa issues. In the very um, beginning, yeah. In the very beginning. Um, and uh, one of his major uh, line items on his resume was uh, he was ranked number one on the US East Warcraft 3 ladder uh, in, during college, which if you don't know, it's a really big deal. That's like, uh, that means he's really good. Like, not as good as if he was ranked number one on like the Korean ladder, which would be really good, <laughs> but it's still pretty decent. Um, and so uh, uh, I, I really think, it, you know, if anyone here is in charge of those sort of athletic scholarships things, you guys should consider uh, <laughs> esports athletes. Yes? Uh, it didn't sound like you were motivated by any particular idea, um, especially in the first stages when you were in college. So what do you think was your prime like, personal drive to continue what, with what you were doing? I, th I think that like our drive for a long time, at, le at least for mine, was like all of these other people who we graduated with went on to like go into consulting and banking with the law school. They started making money, started making a lot of money. And uh, we had done this entrepreneurship. We weren't paying ourselves a lot, but at least we like could say like, oh, you know, we're our own bosses. We're like making our, our own way. And so what kept me going was mostly ego to like not admit that like maybe this wasn't the greatest decision ever. Um, it was the greatest decision ever though. In well, retrospect, in retrospect yeah. yeah, it's easy to say that now. But, <laughs> but I think for, for a long time it was just like, oh, I want to, like, this has to work. But, and I think that's why a lot of like younger uh, startup founders are, are successful is because, you know, you don't really have any optionality. Like we didn't have any skill sets to like go get another job really. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I'm now, I'm now grossly unqualified to do anything other than start and run companies. Um, yeah. Like I don't know how to do I don't But, but no one wants you when you're like 25 years old yeah. and you've, you have a failed start and no one's like, we need that guy to run our company. <laughs> <laughs> no, no those, those opportunities aren't everywhere. I think for me that what in the beginning, uh, the, what got me into startups in the beginning was uh, as a desire to make a lot of money. And then uh, what kept me there though after we got into it, like that doesn't like keep you going. The problem with like being like motivated by money is if that's all, really all you care about, like there's faster and better ways to make money than startups, it turns out. Um, and like if that's really what I cared about, I would have should have gotten into finance. And so um, what kept me going is once you, once you like create this thing and it's like running, there's this like obligation to not fail almost, right? Like I think it's, it's very similar yeah. to what Justin was saying where like I just didn't want to lose. Like I didn't want, I didn't want to be one of the founders who went through YC and then quit and went back to grad school. Like I wanted to win really badly. And yeah, it's a, it's a kind of an ego thing, uh, to be honest. And like, that was, yeah. that's what's kept me going for. Eventually, I think I found much more of like intrinsic purpose in it. Like I, as I've gotten better at doing it, I just really enjoy the work and I, I think it's really interesting and really enjoyable and I like, I just like doing it. I mean, that, that's actually what motivates me to come into work now. Like it's certainly not money and uh, it can't be ego because if there's an ego thing, I think I feel I probably achieved that a while ago. So, like, I feel like it's it really is just the at this point the work has become intrinsically inter interesting, um, but it certainly wasn't in the beginning. In the beginning, it was just really painful. I think I think you make a lot of representations to other people in the beginning too. Like in the early years, you know, we hired employees and promised them that it's going to be a big company, and we raised money from people and we promised them it was going to be a big company, and you know, we wanted to like actually keep our promises. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, my question relates to the business case and uh, Amazon's purchase. So, is it that Amazon thought they could do it? They've got quite a piece of the hosting market. So, was that the cost that they could take out to run it a bit more efficiently than maybe how Twitch was set up? Or no, we we run all all, all our own hosting. Actually, um, we actually you know at least in North America push more bits than Amazon does. Um, the uh, I think there's a big there's a, you know on the Amazon purchase there's a good strategic alignment between where we want to go in gaming um, and how we see ourselves as a distribution point for games and, and, uh, and a way for people to find out about what games to buy and socialize around games. Uh, 
and what Amazon wants to do. Um, Amazon has a game studio, uh, multiple game studios now, actually. They've got a, a game framework. They, AWS, Amazon Web Services, powers the back ends for more than half of video game developers today and growing. So I think they, they just sort of saw us as part of that portfolio of uh, uh, services to the games industry. And I think, you know, so far it seems like it's working out. Hi, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah. Um, I have two questions, actually. One is, once you matured your process of developing good products and you were looking to do something greater with them, um, how did you find mentors to help you understand the spin-off process? Um, and also, how many people were in the company when you were bought uh, by Amazon? So when we were bought by Amazon, we had 172 employees, I think. Um, and uh, when we spun off Twitch, well, we didn't, we didn't necessarily spin off. So when we spun off Social Camp and pivoted the company to work on Twitch, I think we had 24 employees. Yeah, we started talking to a few. Um, we basically asked a few people. Matt Sanchez was one. Keith Raboy, I remember we, asked, we talked to him. Um, someone from YouTube. Um, YouTube guy also, I remember him being influential. I can't remember what his name is now. Oh, Gideon. Yeah. Yeah, Gideon uh, Yu, who was yeah. the CFO of YouTube. Talked to a few people, basically, and, you know, they... I think Matt was the most helpful. Yeah, Matt like was the most helpful. most goal setting. useful advice. We just, you know, had talked to people who had kind of done, been through similar situations before or had, like, lots of operational experience. Yeah. It wasn't really that... Mostly we figured, like, just sort of muddled our way through ourselves. Um, and I also don't think that we did a... A very excellent job of it, to be honest. No, like the spinoff. No, yeah, it, it turned out okay. I, I don't recommend running multiple products under no, one. It's a bad idea. Roof. Don't do it. We also had four co-founders, which is also a bad idea. Don't have four co-founders. Like three max. Two is best. Three is better. Three is okay. Don't have four co-founders. We made a lot of mistakes. But you know, it worked. So it worked. Well, so you know, I don't know. Well, you know, I don't know. All right, yeah. Just two more questions. Yeah. So one there and one over here. All right. Yeah. So what do you think the future of the Android and iOS would like? Uh, the future of Android and iOS. Yeah. So, uh, it's funny if you'd asked me this two years ago, I'd have said like uh, mobile web was going to be uh, like the dominant force, and I still think you know in the very long run mobile web will be. But uh, our experience today, and I think this is true for all my friends' companies as well, is that uh, mobile web is getting uh, dropped in favor of building for both platforms, um, and I think that. We're likely to see Android continue to pick up steam, continue to, to continue to grow. It's our experience. Um, Android's exploding, um, but iOS is not at iOS's expense. It's just that everything is growing. The mobile market is still growing like crazy, um, and so um, we're likely to see at least for the next you know three five years. Uh, I think a continuation of the current trend, which is uh, huge investment into mobile apps and huge opportunities in those space. Um, oh, another. Last Sorry. question. Okay. Last question. Uh, when you were when you were doing your initial development, um, I see that you've got with Twitch two users. You've got the folks doing the broadcast, and you've also got the people consuming those broadcasts. Which uh, which constituency did you pay attention to the most? That's actually a really really good question. Um, so when we started Justin TV, uh, the answer was both everybody. Like Justin TV is a platform for for viewers and broadcasters. We have to care about both sides of the market. Um, and this is the thing we're building for, for everybody. I mean, in fact, we actually kind of want a world where broadcasters and viewers might switch back and forth, for all we know. Like, we don't even know that they're distinct groups. Uh, for Twitch, we had a very clear, very specific point of view on that. The broadcasters are everything. They're the only thing that's important. Get the great content, get the great broadcasters, you win. Um, and that was a huge, huge change from where we'd been running the company before. And it was crucial uh, to exactly the thing I was talking about earlier, the user interfacing part of it, because we didn't talk to viewers. Like, I don't think we talked to a single viewer during the design for Twitch. Um, we talked exclusively to broadcasters about their needs and what they wanted. And the nice thing about talking to broadcasters, of course, is that they have viewers and they care about the viewers, and so they kind of act as a proxy for the other side of the market, but we really just talked to the broadcasters. And that was, uh, that was actually a really pivotal change for how the company was run and extremely important. And I actually generally, this is something I, when I talk to people who are uh, starting marketplace companies, even if it's, Twitch doesn't look like a marketplace company, but of course it is. There's, it's, it's a two-sided market. It's an attention market instead of a money market, but same issue. Um, one of the things I really uh, push really hard is which, of your, which side of the market is more important? Which side of the market is, is the bottleneck, is the hardest part to win on? 
and like try to get them to focus on that side of the market. Um, and it varies. Sometimes it's the buy side, sometimes it's the sell side. It depends on the specifics of the, uh, of the industry. Great. Cool. Thank you. You guys have any last words for us? No. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Well, again, another warm welcome back to uh, Justin and Emmett. Thank you so much. <laughs>